Hey, John, this is great. Really appreciate your time out of your busy schedule uh, to speak with us on the Living Undeterred podcast today. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this will be interesting. You and I have talked a number of different times, and I kind of like to keep the show fairly <clears throat> fairly organic and fairly um, unscripted. Uh, I don't know. You've probably done quite a few of these type of podcasts, and uh, some are pretty strict and some are pretty free. Mine is free. We can go down any road that yeah. you wish as the guest. So, oh, very good. No, I appreciate it. I think that uh, it would be a really good opportunity to talk about, um, you know, the first dose prevention strategies. There's a lot of talk around what to do with these opioid settlement funds. Um, right. You know, there's sixty billion dollars being paid out and to municipalities and to states and. And God bless the uh, contract negotiators because they learned from the um, tobacco settlements that they had to put some real uh, guardrails around how these dollars are being paid out. So they built into the settlement that they needed to go to help uh, abatement, to help ensure that the opioid epidemic, um, we can begin to put it in the rearview mirror. So um, it might be kind of interesting to talk about the fact that there's a lot of discussions around treatment and recovery. And we believe mm. the vast majority of the dollars should be spent on those uh, those efforts. It's a long, challenging uh, path to put the put your addiction behind you uh, as mm. an individual. But what we think is very overlooked is true prevention strategies. What do we do to make sure that you know that that we plug a hole in the boat that's leaking water? How do we make sure that we don't take on more water? while we ensure that we bail out uh, and and, uh, and right this ship. Yeah, there's a lot of roads we can go down on this topic. Um, John, for those who don't know, is the CEO and founder of Greenfinch Health. Um, pretty Goldfinch. interesting. Goldfinch. Gold. I'm sorry, why did I say yeah. Greenfinch? <laughs> Greenwood, Goldfinch. Oh, man. Oh, a lot of colors. <laughs> I was looking at green on the screen, and that right. was in my head. This is the beauty of attention. <laughs> this is why attention deficit is so entertaining for me. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Goldfinch health. There's no such thing as a green finch. Um, but uh, yeah, so your idea, your startup company is fairly young um, and you're one of the founders, but let's peel back and go back in time to where this idea came about, why it's important that we talk about this and then what, what does Goldfinch actually do and, and um, a little bit about you and your, your passions. Yeah, no, that sounds wonderful. Um, you know, my, uh, my background is in research. Uh, I graduated from the University of Iowa. I met my co-founder. He's a PharmD with a pain certification. And I um, uh, was doing pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and um, into kind of the research end of pharmaceuticals. And then I um, was recruited in North Carolina to be the clinical lead for uh, uh, some medical device uh, organizations. And I spent... Um, uh, 10 or 12 years doing that, most notably, or the longest tenure was with a company called Intuitive Surgical, uh, the makers of the Da Vinci robot, and really just fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinating Silicon Valley based m small incision surgery. And it gave me a front row seat, not only in the operating room, but with these world renowned experts as to what they were doing, what was that next advancement. And that's where I, uh, I was. Uh, educated on what's called enhanced recovery after surgery, E-R-A-S. Hmm. And these, these protocols have been around for about 20 years. They're exceptionally well researched. They're just very uh, lightly implemented. It's largely an academic pursuit. And uh, you had asked a little bit about the founding. I was seeing patients that were kind of um, in the dark about what can be done to improve their outcomes and what was actually going on. And it hit home to my family when I actually had an uncle who um, caught a hospital-borne infection after his hip replacement. He didn't get these upgraded patient-centric protocols. And unfortunately, he succumbed to that infection and passed away eight days after his operation. So hmm. that really was when it hit home to yeah. my family how people need somebody on their side. Surgeons need help with the patients as well to kind of bring this all together. And so um, the day that really kind of solidified this, that uh, we kind of stepped off the ledge to found this uh, um, uh, three and a half years ago was my dad needed his hip replacement and he was a much more vulnerable patient than my uncle. He's a little bit younger, but he's on blood thinners and was traveling for his procedure. 
but we were able to advocate remotely for these protocols. And he was climbing the stairs the day after his operation, needed mm. zero opioids at all. And in five weeks, was back to pheasant hunting with his old dog, something he really enjoys in an Iowa winter, which is not, um, uh, which is a, a true test testament to how well he recovered. He got his life back very soon. And that was kind of one of those contrasts as to how valid this is, how needed it is, and mm -hmm. uh, what the results are as well. So I was looking at your website, and I think you have a stat where there's 50 million surgeries annually. Now, is that in the United States? Correct. Yep. Okay. And 5% of those get what are called enhanced protocols. Uh, explain, explain for the layperson what all that means, because it seems like a huge disparity. <laughs> it, it, it is, and it's getting a little bit better, but we're trying to accelerate that along as well. But these enhanced recovery after surgery, E-R-A-S, I encourage you, nothing else to have your listeners take a look at ERAS. We frankly don't right. really like the name in that it implies it's after surgery when a lot of it is about optimizing a patient before surgery and even the morning of their operation. So it, as I was mentioning before, they're exceptionally well studied. They're, you know, Mayo and Johns Hopkins and University of Chicago and UCLA, they're publishing on them regularly. But to actually get your physician um, to adopt them has been a little bit more of a challenge. Sometimes there's a lack of aligned incentives and it's not really the physician's fault. It's kind of our system isn't set up to encourage the adoption. So what are these ERAS protocols? There's about yeah. you know, 10 or 12 of these little things that add up in a very big way, but I'll talk specifically about two of them that we really, that really give a, a really strong uh, impact. If you know anything about a traditional approach to surgery, it's that we can't eat or drink the, uh, after midnight the night before our operation. We don't want anything in our stomach that when we relax your airways that can get into your lungs and cause pneumonia or other problems. And so we give the instructions, blanket instructions, whether your procedure is at 7 a.m. or 5 p.m., you can't have anything to eat or drink. And it's based on, it's frankly not good advice. Um, there is a subtlety, there's a nuance here that we are not doing a very good job of educating our patients on. Hmm. And obviously you don't want anything in your stomach, but how long does something take to get out of your stomach? Well, we know that water is out of your stomach in 30 minutes. Hmm. So we should be encouraging people to be hydrated up to right. really a, an hour or two of, uh, on water if you want to give a window. But what the American Society of Anesthesia, the foremost body on this subject, the anesthesiologist body, says up to two hours before your operation, you can have a clear carbohydrate beverage. Well, what the heck hmm. is a clear carbohydrate beverage? That's where the confusion lies. Give, we give very specific instructions. It's a Gatorade or a Clear Fast, is, which is a whole company made. There's several companies that make, uh, that make drinks that are basically meals in a can. They're high carb, low sugar meals okay. that we should take two to four hours prior to operation. Harvard did a study on this. They showed that the people who got a Gatorade uh, they, they looked at 400 total knees and total hip replacements, and they gave half a Gatorade and the other half, they said, don't eat or drink. And the people who got a Gatorade left the hospital a full day sooner than those who were fasted than those who were That's told crazy. they couldn't have anything to drink. So That's crazy. I mean, it, you would think that'd be out there public knowledge. It is. There, we, we find that there's a lot of misinformation that, and confusion, because if a patient does say, have a donut on the way to their operation, then they do have to delay the operation. But we really lean into the education and trust patients to be compliant and make it very, very simple. Hmm. You know, for instance, handing them a bottle of this medication or a Gatorade and saying, drink this your morning of your operation and nothing else. Avoid any ambiguity or confusion. Right. It's been shown. So there are great institutions that have what's called liberalizing your NPO, a confusing comment that says, basically saying you can have, you know, a black coffee up to two hours before your operation. Or if you have an afternoon uh, procedure, you can have, a, you know, toast and eggs up to six hours prior to your operation. It's right. been shown. That's one component of ERAS that has a dramatic impact. So this pain issue we have in this country, you know, the, the whole 
uh, issue stemmed back from, you know, pain medic meds prescribed Oxycontin primarily in the eighties. Um, the, the amount of those pills went down in the marketplace because prescriptions were cut in more than half yet. We saw deaths go up like a hundred percent. So I guess one of my concerns with some of these things that we think may work is how do we know that they're going to work? I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. our intentions are good. Like let's cut prescriptions out and the results are, are not working because what happened was that we didn't know, I shouldn't say we, but the people making the laws weren't addicts themselves and they didn't understand that it's so bad, the pain, I'm going to go to the street and get it. And they didn't care if it had fentanyl or not. And so that's, that's an adverse consequence of well-intended uh, ideas. Well, you know, do you see that as any barriers or challenges to what you guys are trying to do to make this actually work? No, I, that's a really great question. And, and you're right about these restrictions that were put on that people that didn't really address the addiction. And so people were saying, well, I need to feed that addiction. I need to, because I'm going through withdrawal without it. Um, and talk or about they're pain truly now. in pain. That's or, right. Or they're that's truly right. in pain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so what happens is that you go to any source you can find it and more nefarious and uh, drugs that aren't as clean. So we saw that spike. And so you're right about being well intended. The beauty about um, the, the protocols we're working on is this is really about treating pain better and reducing the number of opioids. So if somebody needs opioids, that's what works for them. Then, right. then that's what works for them. We're not anti-opioid, right. but we are pro-science. And so what the science behind all this literature shows is that you've heard the analogy of get ahead of the pain, stay ahead of the pain. Right. Well, surgery is going to be, you were inducing a lot of trauma. It's, a, it's really acute time when we know you're going to be in more pain because of the incisions and what we have to do internally. And so get ahead of the pain, stay ahead of the pain. Well, let's take that to its natural conclusion. When does the pain start? It's not when we wake you up from anesthesia. The rest of your body has been in a five alarm fire since the moment that scalpel hit your skin, even though now you've got your consciousness back and you're able to start right. perceiving pain. So before the procedure even begins, these ERAS protocols suggest giving non-opioid medications before the procedure begins that morning of to get ahead of the pain, to close off your brain's ability to perceive such extreme pain. So when you mm. come out of surgery, you don't, your body has never, hasn't really developed those breakthrough or that, that communication to say your new knee or your hernia. Right. Uh, and that's how we're able to kind of make the claim and, and show in the literature that these ERAS protocols improve patient outcomes and satisfaction and reduce the number of opioids needed and ingested. So it's really kind of so the best of both worlds. The million dollar question is why is there pushback? And if so, where is it coming from? You know, there's a JAMA just published a journal of American medicine, just published a really great article on what's called implementation science, how in the United States, it really takes a generation, it takes 17 years for something that is uh, really well researched and beginning to get a groundswell to when it's implemented. So we're seeing hmm. that manifest now with enhanced recovery is that, uh, we see some physician adoption, 5% in growing in colorectal surgery, where this really all kind of began. It's higher. It's much higher. We're seeing it in spine as well. But um, we're trying to facilitate and usher it along. And in bridging, we, we use the analogy that, you know, Purdue marketing spent $100 million a year in marketing to imbue in our, in our med schools, in our pharmacy schools, and our uh, in our clinics, how great Oxycontin is right. and others. And now we've cut off that we've cut off the, and there's a rocket and we cut off the fuel, but we're still have so much momentum, but we haven't put any parachutes on it. We haven't put any mm. reversal boosters on it. So we've still got this continuum. Right. And that's kind of what I was talking about in the beginning. Like, how are we unwinding that? How are we deprogramming? these providers that are all really well-intentioned because they don't want patients to be in pain. They don't want them to show up in the ER needing refills, those kind of things. How do we get this alternative method out there uh, to help ensure that physicians are adopting, patients are getting the ERAS experience and ultimately getting all these better outcomes. And that's really what we set out to do. It did not exist, or at least that we could find 
uh, previously, yeah, that's but that's what Goldfinch is about. What's uh, the amount of money that's wasted, you know, per year um, that you guys plan on um, saving? Well, we estimate our, our not only do enhanced recovery protocols improve opioid use and length of stay in the hospitals, which we've addressed, but we take it a step further. People are um, uh, people are out of work and away from their life for far too long as well. So as a natural extension, we're showing we've had independent validation from third party auditor uh, called the Validation Institute that we're saving over a month faster recovery. So people are getting it back. And we put the number of recovery at something like $40 billion in, in, in unnecessary labor expenditures hmm. just, for the, just for the labor portion of it. Now, we're having conversations with um, CMS and, and, and other government affiliations that look at things like step-down care facilities. When somebody who's elderly goes under anesthesia, they have a very high propensity. It's up to, uh, it's up to 40% of post-op, it's called post-op delirium and dementia, meaning we kind of, these, um, anesthesia is a, is a poison. Uh, that's why it works. We have an anecdote to it. But when people come out of it, they come out of that fog. And that means they have to spend longer time in nursing homes and uh, 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 more reliance on family and all of those challenges. Sure. The numbers with some of the insurance companies we're talking to is just almost untold. It's just so incredible. If we can improve upon that, you look at things like infection rates being cut by um, uh, cut in half, readmissions in half, the dollars are staggering because our current healthcare system is not great. But there's this really great body of scientific evidence to how we can apply a, a modern version of surgery. And um, when you do that, the outcomes are really tremendous. Yeah, the uh, preparation prior to the surgery, I guess people don't put a lot of thought into that. Um, you know, it's just, but look at an athlete, look what they do the day of. I mean, if they have a seven right. o'clock tip off in the NBA, those guys are in there at nine, 10 in the morning, getting the uh, ice down, getting the massages, doing the Correct. stretching, doing the you know, the, the mindfulness meditations, they're doing everything to prep themselves for game right. time. And then afterwards, then they go through their normal, you know, no. uh, icing down and all that stuff, but they don't, they probably spend more time before than they do after. 100%. And you think of that's for a game. Now your spinal fusion surgery or your hysterectomy or your cancer operation is more traumatic than, you know, two hours on the court or an hour right. on the court. And so it's, it is, uh, it's a very good point. And we make the argument that, yeah, leading up to your operation, protein loading, a little bit of walking, and then very specifically, it's, it's kind of multi parts, but there's things you can do kind of more holistically. You'd even mention mindfulness, things like that. Mm -hmm. We also dive really deep into the science. And I think it's worth mentioning, like the morning of your operation, Tylenol. Another drug called Celebrex, which is like your ibuprofen, but it has a unique characteristic in that it does not interfere with bleeding risks uh, during surgery, which a traditional mm. NSAID can. So things like that, they can do long act, you know, Novocaine like you get at your doctor's office or at the dentist's office. They have a, a, relative, a cousin of that that they can inject that lasts for a couple of days. So when you combine those kind of things, you get really optimized. You're better off on a than a normal day of going into surgery. But our traditional approach, when we've made you fast, you're intimidated, you have, you maybe have a caffeine addiction that now you've got a headache for, and we take you into surgery, right. it's almost like you're worse off than a normal day. And by reversing it, like the professional athletes you're mentioning, uh, it can really optimize their performance and their outcomes, especially with the surgery patient. Well, I'm all, I'm all about downside risk and I, you know, I can't assess, I can't see where there's a lot of downside risk in this approach. I mean, it seems to me it's either neutral. In other words, like the placebo effect where it doesn't really work, mm -hmm. but the patient think it does when to me, that still works. <laughs> um, and, or it, it works, but I just don't mm -hmm. see a lot of downside with prepping for something like this, which you probably is probably healthy stuff you're doing anyway to your body. Right. Right. And, and I'll give you an example because it's, um, of some of the challenge for implementation. So just use this example, the Gatorade example I was using. If someone, and I want to be very clear that the right. instructions are two to four hours prior to your operation. If you're diabetic, maybe you want to say three to four. You can't have it walking into the OR. 
Right. And you don't eat anything unless you've got specific instructions for a physician. But if a patient says, if a patient, you know, misunderstands that or thinks, you know, milk or skim milk or whatnot is a clear carbohydrate beverage, they drink that. They show up to the ER or show up to the OR. They do need to delay your operation then so that can clear out of your stomach. Sure. So now that throws the whole day in a, a, a mess and it's complicated and, you know, there, there's a, there's 20 people working on your operation, that kind of thing. So what do we do? We say we can't really trust patients to be compliant. So we have to give the standard instructions. And so that's a reason. It does take extra education. It takes understanding from a patient. But we believe with better education and simplified material, we can get there. That's just an example of why most people are still being told don't eat or drink after midnight. Right. All right. So we're 20 minutes in. I want to talk about something I've been wanting to talk about. <laughs> and that's, that's the startup space. So um, as you know, uh, we're launching a, a teen, uh, what we're calling the one page mental health plan for Gen Z's, our market. And so I've never done a startup. I'm 56. A startup to me was sleeping in my car and selling life insurance door to door for, you know, 15 years. Um, <laughs> that, that was, you know, that was my startup. So to be 56 and to have this idea for two years in my head that, you know, I really want to be an advocate for mental health. I want to use the story of my son and my wife to do good. And, and I want to, I want to go after the prehab, the prevention area. That's, that's where I think I'm best served for me. Not that I'm against the supply side. Certainly I'd like to see the drug cartels, you know, eradicate, stop selling fentanyl and China, the precursor chemicals, I, and change the laws and make them tougher for the drug lords. I, that was a ship I never wanted to be on. I just think there's already enough people doing that. And I don't mm -hmm. know if I was going to do any good, but I think the demand side, the prevention, the why, why kids are making these decisions. So I came up with this idea for this app and we would focus on these quadrants and it would be interactive. And so, and, um, I met with somebody, I said, let's form a company. I reached this uh, company in DC called three advanced to build the app. Cause I, like I joke with my boys, I go, I can't even program my VCR. And my youngest goes, dad, what's a VCR. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I was using, you know, yeah. wow, I'm really old. And yeah, so, DVD, um, yeah, you mean yeah DVD, eight yes. track, How about eight track, <laughs> okay. eight tracks, like antique. <laughs> um, but you know, so I got to thinking, it's like, God, a startup company. And then all of a sudden it hit me. It's like, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's the, that's the keep learning type. Uh, we tell our kids and we tell adults and we tell even our parents, my dad's 90 and he's still learning things regularly uh -huh. to stay fresh and stay sharp. So I came up with this idea. I don't know what I'm doing. I really trust this group that we hired is going to really help us build something pretty impactful. I met you kind of, I'm not really exactly sure how you and I crossed paths, but We've talked a number of times. You called our radio show the other day, which was awesome. Um, but I've wanted to pick your brain about your startup journey. You guys are about four years out now, right? Mm -hmm. Go back to when this idea popped in your head to some of the big decisions you made, some of the stuff you didn't do. And then what have you learned looking back? So anyone watching this is starting a business or is crazy enough to do an, an, an app startup company. Maybe you can add some wisdom and guidance on, on what did you learn from your journey? Cause I'm just dying to know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And, and really speaking of million dollar questions, um, that is, that is, everyone's got their own, um, experience, but I know that, you know, the, the number one thing is you cannot go into it, um, with the primary financial, uh, consideration because it's just, it's so challenging. I agree. It, you has to be, passion you have to live and breathe it it becomes an extra child I agree. uh you have to have family involvement as well too um because it 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 is tough and there it's very competitive and it's not even the space you know startup space is not um competitive necessarily you might have a unique idea but it's competitive and that there's a lot of how many apps are there you know mm -hmm. how many different ideas or, or areas can you go we only have so much bandwidth but I'll tell you, I know the day that I uh, realized I had to do this um, was when I came to the realization that if I got to the end of my life and was I going to be uh, more regretful that I tried it and failed 
yeah. or that I never tried it and wondering what would happen. Right. Right. And that was the moment I'm really realizing, like, you know, you, there's such a short time here on earth. You want to leave an impact. Right. You want to do a change. And I know I came from, um, you know, my family owned a small business and an entrepreneurial background, and it was kind of in my blood. But um, I also, you know, knew having one of the things that I would, that I've learned or that I would almost, um, if we were to go back and start again, the, my co-founder, Brand Newland, had a great quote. He said, I'm not sure how we're going to get our first client, but I know how we're going to get our fifth. Getting that first group or that first client, I'd ha- try to have as lined up as possible hmm. to get out of the dock, out of the gates. We went out of the gates with a pilot a, a study, and it was great results. But I think we would be six to nine months further ahead if we had a client lined up before we uh, uh, ventured out. That being said, I've loved it and we're passionate about it. We've gotten some great results. And one of the challenges and benefits is that you can be nimble. You can find out exactly where your product market fit is. So be flexible. Don't be rigid in your thinking um, because tweaking, you know, two or three percent here or there, you're still going to have the core of your company. But that's right. what others will, are going to want to see. And I, I did, you know, initially thought of maybe like going the lower cost uh, entry levels. And those would be, uh, maybe, a like a texting service or a website, let's say that's, you know, websites are basically free. Um, but just in doing my research and kind of at the age I'm at the stage of my life time is, you know, I'm, I'm 56. So it's like, time isn't an enemy yet, but it's not my best friend. You know what I'm saying? It's like 20 years. I'm going to be 76. It's like, I can remember what I was doing 20 years ago. That that's mm-hmm. kind of terrifying to be at this middle age where I'm at to know that I'm <laughs> 76. I'm, I'm just as close to that age as I was. And I think about something I did when I was 36, I'm going, Holy crap. It's like, I better get, I better get going. <laughs> so I got this sense of fear. And I told this to my son the other day we were driving because this, this app we're doing, the name is really innovative. We're calling it Brighton which is the name of my granddaughter. So my son who died, his daughter's name is Brighton. She was born three weeks after he died. So we named the company Brighton. Let us brighten your life. That's kind of our Mm -hmm. mantra. But I'm driving with my son and I said, you know, Roman, you know, my biggest fear, you know, being 19, he's like the fear of death. And I know, cause he knows I like public speaking. So it can't be the fear of public speaking. (laughs) And I said, um, I said, no, it's, I'm not afraid of death whatsoever. I'm afraid of the shit I leave behind. I didn't get done. I mean, who's going to take Brighton, my dream that's now, you know, we have our wireframe done. We're going to be launching it. By the time people see this, the app will almost probably be past the MVP stage, which will be, you know, pretty much live. Um, but I don't know. It's just like, who's going to do that if I die? Mm-hmm. Well, no one. I have, a, I have one awesome employee. I, I'm not even going to call her an employee. She's a partner at this point. Cause she runs everything for Brighton. Her name's Emily and she's out in Las Vegas. Uh, I'll meet her at the expo. I've never actually met her. I, I got her off of LinkedIn of all places, uh-huh. but maybe she could finish this dream of mine, but she won't have the same passion. This is named after my granddaughter. I mean, what, who's going to, so, so I've got this fear and that's why I stay up till two in the morning and I don't sleep sometimes. And it's not because I'm stressed. It's because I don't, I, I don't, I want to get stuff done. <laughs> Did you have that same uh, obsession or worry? 100%. And, and I, I'm nodding because I just love hearing others' entrepreneurial story as well when it, when it has to exist. And even if, you know, your your partner was able to take and run with it, you've got two people working. You've got multiple people working on it now. So that that just becomes so synergistic as well. So, yeah, when it when it absolutely has to exist, that's when you have to do it. I know my personal – and it, and it's, it's it has a um, – these things come back to um, fulfill your life as well. That's what I've noticed mm-hmm. as well. So we went out on this journey, you know, um, three and a half, four years ago to help people and had personal experience um, with losing a family member's surgery, as I talked about. And, and in so we, my wife and I had our third child and he is doing wonderful and he's amazing, but he was born with a cleft in his right eyebrow. And mm. has needed five operations, including a nine-hour re- procedure where they had to remove his skull to reshape his face. Oh, and it was wow. at that point I really understood why we did this. 
Right. He's so unlucky in some regards. He's like the only child in America with a craniosynostosis and a coloboma. But we're so lucky we're in Iowa City where they have world-class eye care. Wow. And his dad is a surgical advocate company founder. I mm. mean, you sometimes when you start down this journey, you don't quite know exactly why you're doing it. And so with Brighton, I'm sure that will manifest for you why you did it, why your son uh, um, uh, went through the challenges he did and your experiences. It, it will, you know, it will reveal itself, I think, in, in spades. I have to tell you this funny story. So about a week ago, I decided to start a journal, my startup journey, you know, and I started writing it every day. I was writing it. I got like five or six pages in it. And I started going back then and reading them. And I thought, this is all negative. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. It's like, why am I doing this? I, I, I can't believe I'm doing this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, so I just erased the project because what the reality is, as a startup founder, there is a lot of time you're spending in doubt. And, you know, even though my heart, my passion, and it's like, all that's great. But I often wonder, you know, I'm at the point where I, there's no return. I mean, we're, we're heading down thousand miles an hour down the highway and with no steering wheel at this point. And it's like, but there's something about the beauty of that, not knowing, not knowing how this is going to turn out, but knowing it's going to get my best effort. It's going to get my best effort. And, and if it doesn't work, it's going to be because I ran out of time because yeah, I'm doing this till my, I'm doing this till my last breath. So right. if Brighton doesn't work, it isn't going to be because I gave up on the project. Mm -hmm. It's going to be because I, I died first. Right. They, they say what, um, startups don't fail. Founders just give up. Um, <laughs> yeah. and that's where that, that's where that passion really comes. You know, you go yeah. to that reserve, like you're, you're on a mission. This has to exist. And, and you're right in that, um, I think that the most challenging day or time is leaving a job that you had. And you may have liked it. I really liked my old job. It was a great company. Uh, but to step off that ledge and to mix metaphors, you burned the ships at that point. You have mm. committed fully to it. It's like your mm -hmm. wedding day. Like It is very binary. And now this is the life you've chosen. And so you have to do everything you can to make it the best it can. And if you're not passionate about it, that, that will be a challenge, but just hearing you speak th about, you know, your, the clock and why this will succeed is exactly why it will, because that's, it, uh, you know, the, when you're in those conversations or you're in sales or it's late and you need to send another email or review another app version, right. that's, you've got to, you've got to love it. And you've got to have that mentality you're talking about. Well, hopefully that, people my age, you know, I was 32 years as owning an investment company done quite well. I could have easily just rode off on my horse. Instead, I just walked out the front door and just walked away from that career. Never had a retirement party. Um, I'm in the middle of actually closing the deal of, of selling no announcement in the newspaper. No, no. I mean, I literally walked out, but I walked out my head held high. Uh, I walked out, you know, on my own terms. Um, and, I'm walking into something that's escal or elevated me to a higher realm of living. And that's, if that can, there's gotta be a lot of people out there my age that are thinking, man, but I'm 56. I, I can't do a startup. What are you kidding me? I mean, I I'm, and, and they're, they're, they're doubting themselves and I, hopefully that they can see what I did. I'm just this normal guy from Iowa and say, well, shit, you know, if, if Jeff can do it, then, why can't I? And that's the whole beauty of sharing stories is that people can, they may not be able to relate to every aspect. Maybe they didn't ha lose a child to fentanyl and a wife to alcohol, but they, but they certainly going to be 56 and they have to decide, do I want to just ride off on my horse and sit on a beach and die, you know, or do I want to dictate terms, relearn things, you know, and, and that's kind of what I'm challenging people, men in their mid fifties to do. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a lot of research coming out about how things like early retirement and just in retirement in general can lead to cognitive decline. And it makes sense. Your, yep. your brain is atrophying. It's not continuing. I look at Warren Buffett, you know, he's a Midwest icon. Um, right. He's still working. I mean, I, I forget his age. I used to know at some point, but he's not a young man. And he doesn't talk about not cementing his legacy uh, in the business world. Um, he doesn't need to do anything. And yet he continues right. to 
to work hard because you find something you're passionate about and keep working those muscles, you know, um, go to the gym literally and figuratively. And yeah. to your point too, that when you look at the statistics about how challenging startups are, a lot of times people look at doing things in their early twenties because you don't have maybe the family or the financial obligations. Right. You can live on couches, things like that. Right. Makes sense. But statistically, businesses are more likely to succeed after the age of 40. Uh, so I, I saw you, that. because yeah. you, you've got some, you know, historic, you maybe have some, some wisdom support, a network, some wisdom, what to do, what not to do. And so that's why it's kind of, uh, you know, an encouraging time. Uh, I'll also mention too, it is never, there's never been a better time to be uh, an entrepreneur, to do a startup than now. The amount of networks uh, out there that are, are, are incubators, accelerators, the amount of funding out there to help people and the openness with even things like Shark Tank being a top television show, people yeah. want to know what is new and novel. And so that's another encouraging sign. Did you ever think about going on Shark Tank? Uh, you know, of, of course, it's kind of a fun and funny idea. And we're <laughs> so passionate about what we're doing. Um, but we're not really a consumer level uh, offering. A lot of those, you look at what really succeeds. Right. It's, uh, it's things you can grab on Amazon. And this is a little or bit. Or Target. Weird. Yep. 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 Exactly. So, um, you know, it's and and the other thing, too, is when you look at I always feel bad sometimes for the entrepreneurs too, because they go in and they're giving up 40% of their company. And um, we would rather take, you know, that 40% and share it with an incredible group of advisors and, uh, you know, and share it with our employees, things like that. So uh, I, I was going to ask you that. That's a, a good premium. question. That's a good question. I mean, well, we've got a few minutes here. I want to, I'd like to have you. So, you know, in the case of a startup where you're hundred percent owner, um, when you're giving away equity, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a, a big influence type name person where they really don't do a lot, but they have their, they, you get to use their name and maybe they do some photo appearances and some things, or do you looking for a, 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 you know, an individual investor or a group of investors? And then obviously you don't want to be giving it away like candy, but, but what, how much equity do you should plan on giving away your first few years? If you have a startup that you own completely yourself, or is it zero? You know, I think it's all, um, you know, uh, company specific. We don't have a high uh, capital need. You know, we don't need to build a warehouse or prototypes, things like that. So that helps. But there are groups that do and maybe they have a patent um, that may have um, their business model requires uh, venturing out to venture capital or to, to other investors, too. So we have a big philosophy of making sure that our employees uh, are all part owners as well in it. Um, I think that just, you know, lends to the culture and that we all benefit from, from uh, great outcomes and great growth. Um, and I think too, the other thing you're kind of asking about, um, you know, in a, in a way when you're going out to do raises, um, who are you looking for? You know, there's a lot of private equity and venture capital and ultimately that's where we really lean on who are the partners that we're working on because kind of, you know, I don't mean this flippantly, but money's money. But there's a lot out there for good ideas. Um, it's still work to get it, but there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of new um, firms. But who are those groups that you think really understand your market, can help you accelerate, and provide you with with good, um, uh, you know, with 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 good advice? You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't rely on them to bring you customers right in the door. That's a bit right. of a fool's errand. But who, who do you want to be partnered with? Because they do become your partner. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, don't, don't feel like there's more, there's more money than there are good ideas. So if you've got a good idea, keep that in mind. Yeah. I, going back to the old, just the work ethic that I grew up with, learned from my parents and stuff was, um, you know, if I stay in the zone of, content providing for the app, the people actually building it then can move, do all the stuff and make it look really cool and focus on the marketing aspect. So what markets do we want to penetrate the quickest way we can do things? Cause our, our market's Gen Z. And if there's one market that you can get viral quickly, it's mm -hmm. Gen Z. I, if I'm marketing to people who are 60, you know, the, the, I, I can't go viral in that market. Mm -hmm. I can't get to a million users in, you know, a month you can on Gen Z, if you get the right mm -hmm. influencer, do the right 
TikTok video. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing TikTok. I would have Gen Z people. You know, I'd be a disaster on TikTok. But but the reality is, I think I think Gen Z is a really exciting market. So I think from that standpoint, um, I like the market we're kind of gearing this towards. Um, you know, and they have they have come out this year. I don't know if I told you this when you're on our show, but it's the first generation of all time in history to have mental health ranked the number one New Year's resolution. So, mm-hmm. oh. and Gen Z's uh, purchasing power in the next like 24 months is going to quadruple. So there's a whole group of Gen Z kids moving into earning an income and, you know, they're going to be looking to, so anyway, I've done, I think I've done some pretty good research, but again, you could have the greatest product. If there's no one to go show it to, it doesn't really matter. Right. I mean, no, for, for sure. And I, and I, that's, that's a really great point on kind of, you know, different marketing strategies, but I particularly think with the Gen Z and the younger crowd, they're more apt to challenge status quo which I think in a lot of times can be a very good thing. Sometimes maybe um, uh, just because it's new doesn't necessarily mean it's better. But Mm -hmm. when it comes to mental health, talk about a really unique and oftentimes unfortunate time to come of age. Right Right in the middle of COVID, you know, we've got at any time you can point to, you know, whether it's the Cold War or the Great Depression, whatnot, we all have these really unique right. you know, experiences to grow up with. Um, But to grow up in a pandemic and miss out on prom and to have scrutiny and to have online schools, which is just tough for everyone, including especially the teachers. Yeah. So that that I'm sure mental health is top priority because they have been subjected to very, very unique um, experience in these formidable years. Yeah, it's... I think it's the hardest time ever to be an adolescent. Um, we talk about this all the time. Uh, you know, when we were, I had three brothers and my dad was a doctor at the university of Iowa. My mom for many years stayed home and raised us. And then she went to uh, ACT and in, in Iowa city and worked. Um, but you know, we used to just sit around, look at each other for a few minutes and say, let's go outside and play, you know? And, and mm-hmm. today kids just, they just don't have that ability. They have the opportunity. They just don't have the ability. And we did, I'm not saying ours is better or worse, but we didn't have these anxiety and depression issues that they have today. So these kids today have more abundance than any, any time in history, especially in America. Yet I'd have to argue they're the worst, most unhappy generation of all time. Mm So something's not working. You know, I'm just, as a mental health advocate, my job is to go out and try to figure out why, you know, and that's, that's the whole purpose behind living undeterred. And Every little aspect, post-surgery care, uh, opioid uh, prescriptions, addictions, these are all fit together. I mean, they all, everything fits together, you know? It, it is it is kind of strange that we, because the brain is so complex for the longest time, we, but we've treated it like just an ancillary organ. You know, we've treated mm-hmm. it like your liver, your lungs, like, oh, just suck it up or uh, it'll be fine. And the reality is like, it is, it is so complex and there's so much, uh, you know, intermingling that when you, uh, intermingling of, um, of relationships and how vital they are to the brain that we just can't right. shut that off. Right. And now that we have, especially in the time when you're learning how to be awkward and not be awkward, how you're right. learning to, uh, you know, be a part of a team or to stand up to bullying or, to not be a jerk, you know, things like that, that we've now, we've, we've not only removed that ability for those social interactions, but we've added the anonymity of being able to be online and the additional scrutiny. And so, yeah, there at least maybe physically it isn't as challenging as some other uh, generations, but mentally, I mean, it is so taxing and uh, that's why I'm thrilled to have, you know, programs and, and uh, advocates like you all, because I know even in my own family with my nieces and nephews, um, uh, we're seeing it, um, you know, manifest. My kids, mm-hmm. thankfully, are a little bit young f- to to really fully appreciate it, but my nieces and nephews are not, and we're, um, you know, uh, trying to help them and work through them. But you see I it coming s- with your own kids. That's, that's uh, I'm Pat, you know, that, that part of my life shift, my kids are, you know, 19 and 21. Mm-hmm. So they're older, but when they were, when they were five, six, seven, and eight, I'll be honest with you, mental health wasn't even on the table. Now, if right. I was a parent of a five, six, seven, eight, 
I would be reading the books, watching the podcast. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, you know, psychologically messing with them right now, kind of planting things in their heads, you know, and trying to do this wizardry. So when they got to be a certain age, I'm not putting out fires, you know? It's, it's so funny you say that because I it just it was just reading on that about being more so supportive for your kids. And uh, and one of those advice is whatever they're into, you should be into as well. And so yeah, I just this morning, I asked my daughter, actually, it was last night, but today I got for grilling. I'm trying to help her. She's nine with division. And I said, I'll let you teach me and quiz me on Pokemon, which is something because I've been ignoring that and pretending it's, it's I love silly, it. But it's, no, it's not great. silly to her. Right. And so I'm realizing, well, I, I engaging her at nine is going to be the same as engaging her at 16. Or I got to set the foundation. At so I'm 100%. still engaged with her at 16. And so I learned I all that. about it on the drive to school today. And so it was a productive I love that. first experience. <laughs> no, and, and you sharing that now, someone's going to hear that that watches this podcast. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you're right. It's like we take addicts and we meet them where they're at with harm reduction. But with our kids, we don't meet them where they're at. So why in the hell don't we meet our kids where they're at? And so if they're at Pokemon, that's in their mind or whatever it is. My, my granddaughter, uh, likes, I think it's Pete, the cat and it's a cartoon or whatever. Mm -hmm. And every time, every time she comes over, I always say pizza cat, like pizza cat. And that just irritates her because she's like, no, it's Pete. (laughs) It's like Pete's the cat. And I go, no, it's pizza cat. And then we'd sit down, I'd watch, I'd watch it or I'd read about it, you know, and we would just joke and, but I'm going into her world, you know, right, right. instead of, exactly. instead of yeah. kind of the way I was, ro- I, I, I was right. raised, you know, my, we just, I don't know. I was raised in the leave at the beaver house. So I can't be critical. I got, <laughs> I hit the lottery. I hit the lottery with my parents. I can't be critical. Um, That's good. but no, I think there's something to learn about going to where people are and listening better and, um, being attentive and aware of being in the moment. Yeah, no, I agree. And I I think that the, you know, with any crisis, there are um, silver linings that come out of it. Um, Mm. And I think if this does give us, uh, there's, uh, there's something to be said by the fact that maybe we're just now being more aware of mental health, but that, but generationally, we've been suppressing it. Right. You know, I, I mean, I'm Irish, I know the conversations are all about you know, funerals and talk about, you know, negative uh, discussions. So a lot of love, but um, there's just a, it's, it's uh, can be sometimes more morose and sweeping things under the rug. And so the fact that maybe um, this has always been there, but things like COVID and a different generation that is more exposed to technology, it's coming to light more and revealing itself to, to um, that, that it needs to be addressed more than ever. Yeah. And maybe, maybe instead of, you know, looking at, um, more solutions, it, it's highly possible. We have them already. We have mm-hmm. everything we need to rectify this, fix this, this trajectory of this ship. Um, we don't need any more. I mean, we need to almost go back to just simple communication, vulnerability, sharing stories and, and less diagnosis, less labels, less, putting people in boxes and more therapists. And it just seems like the more we add and trying to explain things, the more we F it up as humans. But I, and I think too, that there's some really, I, I mean, I just think personally in our life, like I was bullied growing up, not terribly. And, but I know what it's like. I was very, very small and undersized and redheaded and you, you can name it. Um, <laughs> but I, but in a more practical sense, like, you know, my son Reed has, um, uh, he's going to have some challenges. He looks a little different. And so to yeah. know that kids are more receptive than ever and, you know, difference and differences in inclusion is an emphasis, like wasn't a priority until it's a priority knowing that he yeah. can have as normal as normalized as a life as possible. So while we talk a lot about mental health challenges and, and uh, you know, work ethics and things like that, that may be um, generational, I think there's some real value um, in you know, getting people care and destigmatizing yeah. it and, and reducing bullying. And I, I can just tell you, we work a lot with unions and these are the toughest guys on the planet and gals on the planet. And it's been remarkable to see how much they have leaned into 
things like suicide prevention and opioid yeah, addiction. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Then they are like taking it, run with, running with it, and it's really encouraging that some good will come out of this. Well, John, you're living proof of why I love what I do and why the podcast has been such a great way for me to continue meeting people I never would have, you know, we would never have had these type of conversations had it not been for us meeting somewhere along the social <laughs> platforms that we were on. But this is the beauty of collaborating and, and you know, you, you have a business model designed ultimately to improve well-being, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're trying to do, get people mm -hmm. less, less opioids and less pain and quicker recoveries. That's all about improving well-being. I'm talking to Gen Z about mental health issues, things like that, you know, wearing, getting more about fentanyl and suicide awareness that's increasing well-being. So we're both end result want to do the same thing. We just got different kind of, kind of widgets we're promoting, you know? Um, but there's hundreds and thousands of people out there like us that it's all hands on deck, man. I mean, we have to start all of us coming together, not having this one, you know, micro idea and then just betting everything on that and then just excluding everybody else that could actually be an ally of yours. And then, you know, I can promote you guys, you guys can promote me and then we can help more people together and add more people in. And I think we, I think we as an advocates can be unstoppable if we work together, if we stop, stop competing against each other. Certainly. I mean, we talk a lot about, um, uh, we're flying uh, into Chicago. Or we're heading into Chicago. Some of us are flying in for a collaboration um, uh, here next week with a group that others thought we were competitive with. So yeah. they want us to have competitive bids. And we said, we're not competitive. We're complementary. And so by leaning into those things, that there are uh, great ways to meet and to communicate. And when you kind of really look at, we have these tools. What right. um, One of my favorite quotes was, um, uh, it, uh, on entrepreneurialism is that um, the future is here. It's just very poorly distributed. So we mm. know what these solutions are. We've just really got to kind of collaborate and um, be open-minded to new ideas um, and, and executing on them. So my, my last favorite quote, we were talking a little bit about entrepreneurialism, is that um, what, what really startups are all about is working your ass off for 10 years to create an overnight success. So it's kind of one of those things where- <laughs> Isn't that true? It's the 2 a.m. that you had a year ago thinking about this and yeah. someday getting it in the patient's hand. We just helped the patient who is a union member who just got out of rehab last uh, two weeks ago. He had surgery last week and we were in needed his spinal fusion surgery. And we were able to work with that union to get him and the hospital to get him a totally opioid free surgery. So he wasn't mm. back in that ring. And that's the kind of thing that we couldn't do alone. Uh, but you know, it's a great solution out there that we've collaborated to really get to, to improve and perhaps save lives. Makes me think of a podcast, uh, I was on the other day where the host, I was actually a guest on her show and she said, she's a coach, like a life coach. And she goes, we don't do goals because that's a destination. She goes, we work on a direction. Mm-hmm. And that I kind of thought to myself, that's the life of a startup, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have a destination. I just, every day got to do something <laughs> every day. I got to do something to be going in the right direction. And most days, I don't know what direction I'm going north, south, east, east to west, up or down, but I'm progressing somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm that one email I send. That's, that's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. The one conversation meet, you know, an hour today with you. That's a step in the right direction. So I don't know where all these are going to come together. You have to have, as Jim James Collins said in Good to Great, that big, hairy, audacious goal and unwavering mm -hmm. confidence, what you're doing will work. You know, and that's what any startup or any business founder has to have is that unwavering confidence and have that that big, hairy, audacious goal. But I would almost now say big, hairy, audacious direction. You know, mm -hmm. I love that taking the word gold out in my verbiage when I talk to people, goal and talk about directions and processes and then and the, the goal, goal just happens yeah. yeah 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 you advance the ball every day and before you know it you're in the end zone you know it's, right right i think that's a um a great advice thanks for sharing that well i uh, enjoyed our conversation again brother um how do people reach you and if people want to find out more about again not green finch health but goldfinch health um how do people reach you what's the easiest way and um that's it 
Yeah, perfect. They can go to goldfinchhealth.com. Uh, we've got a patient page they can click on or provider page if you're a physician who wants to participate. The other thing I want to throw out there too is um, kind of end where we began. We're helping the hospitals as well to reduce the number of opioids they need to, to write uh, with, um, uh, with adoption of ERAS protocols. And so we've launched what's called the Billion Pill Pledge. Saw that. After, after surgery, there's 3 billion leftover opioids. That's just what's left wow. over after we've taken too many. And we believe with more uh, greater adoption of uh, and more thoughtful prescribing habits and emphasizing opioid alternatives, that we can reduce the number of opioids by a billion. So that's the billionpillpledge.com. And we're working with the state of Iowa on the opioid settlement dollars for really our first uh, large pilot to... Um, and the, the results are really remarkable and the hospitals have been so receptive to the extra support. Well, that's awesome, man. You're doing great things. Um, thanks for being on the Living Undeterred podcast. And as always, keep living undeterred. Okay, John? Thanks, Jeff.